Hello, this is Chris Pike. I'm welcoming you to a special USGBC research podcast. And with me today, I have two special guests, um, Nils Koch and, and Dave Pogue from C.B. Richard Ellis. And Nils is from Maastricht University and Gresby. And we are here to talk about a landmark study called the Green Building Adoption Index. This is work that, the, that this team has done over the last couple of years to provide an unprecedented understanding of the pace and scale of green building market transformation across the U.S. with an unprecedented degree of detail for 30 major markets. And so over the next half an hour or so, we're going to share some of the technical findings and some of the implications. And at, at, from the USGBC perspective, I'd like to, to begin the podcast by offering my thanks and our appreciation for being able to collaborate with Maastricht and CBRE on, on a very important project and our ability to contribute some data, as well as to have the opportunity to host researchers from NIL's team at Maastricht at USGBC's offices last summer. And we hope that you'll find these, these, these results as interesting as we do. And with that, I'll introduce Dave Pope from CBRE. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thanks again for all the help that you folks uh, at USGBC gave for this project. It really would not have been possible without uh, the work that you all did. Um, I'm going to briefly just speak about something that the Green Building Adoption Index is the first product of what we call the Real Green Research Challenge. Two years ago at CBRE, uh, we made a pledge as part of our environmental policy that we were going to find ways to support the academic community in helping us find some answers and solutions to some of the sustainability and environmental issues facing the built environment. And with that, we developed a program that offered up to a million dollars in grants to academic studies around the globe. We put together a group of internal and external experts. We sent out an RFP, if you will, to the marketplace, and we received more than 100 applications. And one of those applications was about this. And from the beginning, we have all been interested in trying to figure out what the impact of green buildings are, whether or not there's really a lot of them, what markets uh, have, have taken uh, this up more than others. Uh, and so we felt that this is really one of those fundamental pieces of information that we needed to have to understand the dynamics of green buildings. And so Nils was providing this uh, and, and proposed this. Uh, we've worked with Nils before on some other items, uh, and we respected the work that he has done, and I was very pleased that he offered up this opportunity for us to work together. And so this, the Green Building Adoption Index is basically the chief objective there was to quantify and understand the dynamics of certified green building space in the top 30 U.S. markets. We've been involved in, the, in, in greening up our portfolio for a number of years. A lot of our properties have now gotten LEED certification. A number of our properties are participating in, in EPA Energy Star and have uh, EPA Energy Star labels. Uh, but we just didn't know whether that was unique or whether we were ahead of the game or whether some clients were doing something that was unique. And so we thought that it would be very interesting to find out how broad the implications were of green buildings in these markets. And so with that, uh, we asked Nils to do this work. Uh, and I'm going to now turn it over to Nils, and he's going to tell you what the results were. But I'll tell you that we were fascinated, uh, we were surprised, uh, and we were very pleased with the results. We intend to do this uh, going forward in future years, and we'll see how it happens. But I'm going to turn it now to Nils Koch to, to tell you the details of the study. Thanks a lot, Dave, and thanks, uh, Chris and the USGBC for hosting this, uh, this podcast. Uh, my name is Niels Koch. I am affiliated with Maastricht University in the Netherlands, um, also known from the now infamous Euro Treaty, uh, and I'm uh, an associate professor in finance and real estate there. I have an economics background, so uh, forgive me my ignorance from an engineering and architectural perspective. I'm also the executive director and co-founder of GRESBY, which stands for the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, which I can talk about very long, but not today. Because today we'll talk about the Green Building Adoption Index. Uh, Dave and Chris gave a short introduction, and I'll give you my view and then get into some of the results. If you think about green buildings, um, I typically think about energy efficiency and also broader measures of sustainability. And those broader measures have been captured by green labels, I think most importantly by the lead label of, uh, of the United States Green Building Council, but also comparable labels like BREEAM in the UK, HKBM in Hong Kong, KESB in Japan, Green Star in, in, in Australia and South Africa, etc., etc. There's been a lot of studies on the financial implications of these labels. So do investors actually take the labels into account when, when, uh, when they buy buildings? Do tenants take these labels into account when, when searching for office space? Um, but we don't have a really good understanding of how big the market for a green building currently is, where it has come from, 
probably from zero, um, and where it will go. And that's important information for policymakers. It's important information for academics, but it, it's especially important information for uh, for investors that make investment decisions of investing in green and non-green buildings, and does need to understand the dynamics of this sort of space in the, in the marketplace. Green buildings are not necessarily new buildings. Green buildings typically have been around for quite a while, but green buildings are those designated in our study by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star system, as well as the USGBC's LEED certification. Energy Star is a, uh, is a fairly broad label, um, um, but focused on energy alone. It looks at office, uh, multifamily, and other property types. And LEED certification includes issues like energy, but also water, waste, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For the purpose of this study, we focus on office buildings only. And um, while someone uh, on the call might or listening to this podcast might say, "Well, I'm invested in, in logistics, real estate, or in multifamily," that's certainly something we want to uh, do going forward. But the best data available to us was in office space. What we have from EPA Energy Star is almost 8,500 office buildings that together is about 2 billion square feet of space. And from the USGBC, we had about 5,500 office buildings, and that together is about a billion uh, square feet of space. So we're talking about significant numbers right here. Maybe it's a bit of background, because obviously we're not the first to look at how big green building is. Some numbers on the generic diffusion of, of LEED and Energy Star certification across states. So what you see on this slide is how big green building is in terms of number of projects, in terms of square footage of green space um, across different states. You see that California seems to be the greenest state, but once you start dividing by, for example, the number of people living in California, um, you see that California is no longer the greenest state in terms of, uh, in terms of office buildings, but it's Washington, D.C., which is technically obviously not a state, um, Illinois, Maryland, Virginia, Massachusetts, and only then California. So in evaluating the importance of green buildings in local markets, or in MSAs, it's very important that you have the right denominator to really understand how, how big green building is in the marketplace. And the same actually holds for Energy Star. The EPA Energy Star program actually also has its own rankings of the greenest cities. They're merely based on the number of certified buildings. And if you just look at the number of, of certified Energy Star buildings, so that's the top 25% most efficient space that's eligible for Energy Star, um, at least if you apply for it, LA seems to be the greenest city or the most efficient city in the US, followed by Washington DC, Atlanta, New York, et cetera, et cetera. But once you start, for example, dividing by, um, by, the, by, by the number of people living uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the area, or you start looking at the square footage of space, you see that the rankings change. So by square footage, Chicago is the most efficient city, at least from an office building perspective, followed by New York, DC, et cetera. So importantly, rankings of, 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 of green building diffusion differ by, uh, by, the, well, by the number that you look at and by the denominator that, that you use. What we started to do in this study, what we propose to do in this study, and when I say we, I mean uh, Roger Holtermans, my esteemed colleague at Maastricht University that spent a couple of months at the USGBC headquarters to go through all the archives. Uh, it was a lot of, lot of work, um, yeah, put in, a lot, put in a lot of work and a lot of hours, collected a lot of information on um, green certified space and importantly matched that with information from CBRE um, on the size of, uh, of, uh, of markets. We decided to look at the top 30 largest markets as, the, as, uh, as determined by CBRE. Uh, those markets are metropolitan areas and they have geographic boundaries. So basically using geocoding, we can find for every green building in the country whether the building is within the geographic boundaries of a CBRE market. So now we really start to define granular markets and we need to define what we want to include there, both from a numerator as well as a denominator perspective. For green buildings, we look at LEED and Energy Star, office only. Um, we don't look at LEED uh, uh, CI. We don't include medical or government occupied buildings. So this is really liquid office space. If you're a tenant and you're looking to lease space or you're an investor, you're looking to buy space, that's the type of space that we're looking at. Well, we also apply this at tracking threshold. And this is a little technical, but we want to make sure 
that in the denominator that we used, that it's aligned as much as possible with the numerator. So if CBRE says, well, we only look at buildings that are larger than 25,000 square feet, we also include green buildings only that are larger than 25,000 square feet. Two more corrections. Label vintage. We correct for label depreciation. We believe um, that if your building is Energy Star certified, two years after the certification date, that label is no longer being taken into account by the market. So we only look at Energy Star certification that has been given in this year and the year prior, and then we do that for every year on a rolling basis. For LEED, we take a five-year depreciation period. So we say, well, if you were certified in 2005, in 2010, it's the last year that we that we count you in. In 2011, unless you recertify, you're no longer in our measure of green building space. That brings us to two ratios. The number of buildings that are certified in one of these 30 MSAs and the square footage of space uh, that's certified in each of these uh, these uh, 30 markets. And of course, being here in the room with uh, with uh, with Chris Pike and with Dave Polk, I uh, you know I have to say that this was only possible with the partnership of CBRE and USTBC, but that's really true because they provided the very important data that we use here. So, in terms of methodology that you would expect now from the academic, I'm not going to show you equations because we didn't really need a lot of equations. But I am going to show you some statistics before I um, before I then take you through some of the philosophy of how we uh, how we further got here. What you look at in this graph is one of the most important results. You say, well, that's a boring that's a boring picture. It is a boring picture, but it shows you the diffusion of green space, the adoption of green space as measured by Leet and Energy Star from 2005 to 2013. In the dotted line, you look at the square footage of buildings, and in the uh, bold solid line, you look at the number of buildings. And what you can see is that green buildings in 2005, by number, was really, really small. It was actually almost nowhere to be seen. In terms of square footage, it was, it was a little bigger because some of the buildings that were certified were big buildings. But in 2013, 20, sorry, 39% of, uh, of the office space that we looked at in our sample was certified by either LEED and or Energy Star. And that's a very, very high number. If we look at the number of buildings, we're looking at a, at a number that, that's about 13%, and I'll give you the exact statistic in, uh, in, uh, in a minute. So green building in the 30 largest MSAs in the U.S. is really a, a significant part of the market. Now, let me take you through some more details and then, uh, and then through a couple of markets. First, we look at Energy Star. So remember, we look at green buildings designated by both Energy Star and LEED. Energy Star, at the end of 2013, was about 30% of, uh, of, uh, of the office market as measured by square footage, and it was over 10% as measured by the number of buildings. But what we see is that these diffusion curves start to uh, start to basically stay constant. They're not sloping down, but the uptake of Energy Star certification seems to really get to uh, to uh, well to, to kind of its maximum level. And by design, that's also something that you would expect because by design, only the top 25% of uh, of, uh, of buildings are eligible for Energy Star. In terms of buildings, we're certainly not there, but in terms of square footage, we seem to be very close to that number. It's also interesting to look at the adoption of the LEED program. Uh, LEED is, 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 um, is, is more challenging in, in terms of getting, getting certification. It's, it's more holistic than energy efficiency alone. And what we see is that really since 2008, the uptake of LEED certification has, well, basically just exploded. And it was also due to the, uh, uh, to the introduction of, um, of the LEED for existing buildings program. By the end of 2013, um, about 5% of all the buildings in the U.S. commercial office market that we look at were LEED certified. And by square footage, it's about 19.44%. Uh, that's not just about, that's the exact number. So every one in five well, square meters or square feet that you look at has been certified by, uh, by USTBC's LEED program. And obviously, that number is going to differ per market. We can break down the LEED certification into different types of certification. We have LEED EB, LEED Core and Shell, a lead for new construction. We first look at the percentage of buildings that has been certified. You see that, especially on the lead EB side, uptake has been fairly rapid, and that makes a lot of sense because lead for new construction also needs new construction, and we know that new construction only comes on the market in a, in a very slow fashion. We're not constructing whole new cities like we, like uh, like people do in China. So you see that 
about 1% of, uh, of the office space in our top 30 commercial markets has been certified by Lead Core and Shell. Um, 1%, about 1% has been certified by Lead for New Construction, and more than 3% has been certified by Lead for Existing, bu existing Buildings. But look at the numbers in terms of square footage, and you'll, you'll again appreciate the differences. Lead for Existing Buildings is now 16% uh, of, uh, of the market, uh, with lower numbers, uh, about 3 to 4%. Uh, of lead for core and shell and lead for new construction. So very high percentages of, of lead certification really driven for the largest part by lead for existing buildings. Now to summarize this for you, and all of this can be found in the uh, in the Green Building Adoption Index report that uh, that can be found on the on the on the CBRE on the CBRE website. But these numbers are interesting, and this is this is the summary. So if we purely look at green buildings overall, Energy Star and Lead together. Obviously, we take out overlaps of the buildings, both LEED and Energy Star certified. We only count it once. In terms of number, it went from 1.5% to 13.2%. And remember, this is an average across the 30 largest markets in the U.S. Chicago, San Francisco, New York, Atlanta, Houston, etc. So they're really the markets that matter to investors. If we look at Energy Star labeled, numbers are, are, are even higher. Um, and LEED certified, given... And how challenging it is to uh, to uh, to get lead certification, or at least any uh, efforts that you have to put into it, and the quality of a building that that reflects uh, these numbers came from basically nothing in 2005. 0.14% of buildings were certified to more than 5% in 2013, and that's about 20% or 19% of the commercial office market. Now, obviously, depending on where you listen to this or or, or where you watch this you're interested in how your city actually performs. So we can rank the 30 markets that we look at in terms of how green they are. And mind you, we only look at, at certification of buildings. So this is not a statement about the broader greenness of, of, these, uh, of these cities. Minneapolis in our study is the city with the, by far the largest fraction of green space. 77% of the um, Minneapolis office market as measured by CBRE uh, green measures, USGBC and, and, uh, and EPA, 77% of that market by square footage has been certified as green. San Francisco, maybe not surprisingly, following Chicago, Houston, Atlanta, LA, Denver, Seattle, Miami, Washington, DC. But look at the difference between, for example, number 10 and number one. That's really quite significant. Now, we're all obviously interested in the leaders, but we're also interested in the green challenged cities. And this is not necessarily negative, and we see that these buildings have a lot of potential, actually, to start greening up their buildings. Our number last is Pittsburgh, with about 10% of, uh, of its floor area by square footage, purely office, certified either by LEED or by Energy Star, followed by Kansas City, Stanford, Detroit. And, for example, we also have cities like Portland and, uh, and, and Phoenix there, even though those markets have almost a third of their markets certified either the EPA or the USGBC, so are not really green challenged. But there are some, some laggards to be found and some work to be done. I want to zoom into some of these uh, some of these individual cities. You see 30 cities and regions. You look at your watch. You've been listening for about 20 minutes, and you're afraid I'm going to talk about all of these. Well, don't worry. I'm not going to take you through all of that. But in the report, you can have, um, have a detailed view on each and every one of the cities that we uh, evaluated in this study. And I'm going to take you through, uh, through some of them. First, our number one, Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis, and you can see it again in the, in the bottom right, 77% of, uh, of its floor area certified as green. Um, that's about 62% Energy Star and about 39% LEED. So those are really quite significant numbers. We looked for each and every of these cities at regulation, and we looked at tenant demand, and we put in some additional facts. Um, if you, for example, think about regulation, uh, Minneapolis recently passed an ordinance for mandatory disclosure of building energy performance. So buildings will have to show how they perform. Also, if your energy star score is below 75, you'll have to have to show it. And this might lead to further uptake of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of energy star if people that have an energy star score of 65 or 70 make their building perform better and, and, and also get into the energy star range. We also see um, some fundamentals for, for tenant demand for green, uh, for, for, for green space. Um, according to the brokers, the local brokers of CBRE, the market values green and there's a deep cultural embeddedment of, uh, of, um, 
of um, of valuing green space. Well, I have to re rely on the, on those facts because um, for this Dutch guy, the cultural knowledge of Minneapolis is quite limited. Um, then some facts. EPA ranks Minneapolis 16th. This is interesting. So that's by a total numbers of green buildings. But again, this shows that that's probably not the right measure to look at. And there's a couple of interesting buildings to uh, to look at. First building was certified an Elite EB Gold in 2004. And there's a building that we found that has been certified by Energy Star 10 times and is lead for existing buildings at the gold level. Our number second, or uh, well, our green city that we expected, San Francisco. Having spent a long time in Berkeley, I wouldn't expect anything else. San Francisco has been leading in terms of regulation uh, when it comes to uh, mandating green space in, in new construction, etc. And that, um, well, that shows ultimately in the numbers, even though the percentage of, of the space that has been certified under LEED NC new construction and core and shell is still fairly low, a large part of the existing building stock, 38%, 37.5%, has been LEED certified and 52% of the buildings have been Energy Star certified. And what's important, because you might say, well, San Francisco is very mild, it's never really cold, never really warm, so sure, it's easy to be efficient. Energy Star standardizes its, its, its scores um, for local weather conditions. So it's not the case that, you know, if you don't have to heat and cool a lot, that it's easy to get a higher score on, on Energy Star per se. If we think about tenant demand, well, there's a lot of Fortune 500 headquarters, um, as technology and financial services that like to be in, 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 in green space and more efficient space and nicer space. Um, EPA ranks San Francisco as number fifth. And my personal favorite that I was allowed to put in is 101 California Street, 12 times Energy Star certified. It was built in 1980, so by now it's 34 years old. It has two chillers in the basement, and it's amazing that I know this as an economist, but I toured the building. And only one of those chillers is used because the building is, is run so efficiently. Consistently is one of the Energy Star high performers in the country and has also been certified as LEED EB Platinum recently. So it's a real crown, crown jewel, I would say. A couple more cities, quickly. Chicago, number three. Chicago also um, passed benchmarking ordinance recently, and that was actually after we did our study, or kind of while we did our study. Um, it is one of the major cities for corporate headquarters. It's a, it's a global uh, investment target city. has a lot of business services. It's an important real estate city. Um, so those are all fundamentals that drive the demand for, for green space. Um, ranked number six by the EPA, and there's many interesting buildings in, in Chicago generally and from a green perspective. Houston. I wanted to put in Houston because I think Houston is an interesting example. A lot of new construction, about 4% of the buildings uh, in, uh, in Houston has been certified under lead core and shell and a lot of percent as lead for, new con uh, lead for new construction. So it shows you that activity in new construction really translates into higher fractions of, uh, of for example, lead. But obviously Houston is also the hotbed of the oil and gas industry um, and I always say that well, these industries like to offset, like they like to offset their environmental risks. Um, call it greenwashing, or just call it being a good citizen where you actually can. Um, and then quite some corporate headquarters there. Um, there's also some regulation, surprisingly, in uh, in uh, in Houston, Texas, related to lead certification, but that's mostly for city-owned buildings. And then Atlanta. Atlanta um, is the city in the U.S. with uh, with um, uh, one of the highest percentages of Fortune 500 uh, headquarters. That translates into quite a high adoption of uh, of, of green space because because it's those tenants that are actually looking for uh, for green building certification. And then to end, because you know we got to have something to wish. We look at Kansas City and Minneapolis. Kansas City is not ranked by the EPA. It has some green buildings, actually. It's, 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 it's not nothing. And what we see is that from a new construction perspective, um, it's actually one of the highest percentages of new construction, lead for new construction, lead NC, in our study. So there's hope for Kansas. There's also hope for Pittsburgh. And um, when presenting this study, people in Pittsburgh said, well, it's unfair that we're number 30th. Uh, this study doesn't say that Pittsburgh as a city is in green. It just says that the number of buildings that are certified is still quite low. We believe there's, that, that there's a lot of upside for, for, for growth here. Only 6% of the buildings is Energy Star certified. Only 6% of the square footage uh, has been LEED certified. 
Again, new construction diffraction is quite high, but there's really potential for a lot of the existing buildings to be retrofitted and then to be LEED certified. So with that, we get to uh, we get to a couple of conclusions and and uh, and discussion. So if you uh, f did a fast forward to the end of the presentation, just listen to the conclusions. What we did in the Green Building Adoption Index is looking at the adoption of green space across the 30 largest office markets in the U.S., combining information on the general office market, the size in terms of square footage and buildings from CBRE, and information from the USGBC and EPA on green measures. And what we find is that there's a very rapid diffusion, as an economist would call it, of green space. We started in 2005 and green building was virtually non-existent. It was really, really very small. And in 2013, 40% or 39.27% of the market had been certified by either LEED or Energy Star. And specifically for LEED, there was 19.44% of the market's overall on average. So those are very high numbers. There is, however, a large geographic variation in the adoption of LEED and Energy Star, with Minneapolis, and San Francisco, and Chicago leading, and poor Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Detroit uh, being in the, uh, in the lower ends of our, our rankings. We find that larger buildings are earlier adopters of green space, we also see that some markets may have reached a saturation point, and I'll be curious to hear the views of, of Chris Pike and Dave Polk on, uh, on, uh, on that. Markets with overall low adoption actually show a lot of promise because we do see that certification for new construction numbers are actually quite high and, and typically higher than in the markets that have a lot of uh, uh, green space at this moment. So what's next? Well, for us what's next is that Chris is going to reflect on this um, but for um, for Maastricht and CBRE, the plan is to update this study on an annual basis. So um, in the first quarter, at the end of the first quarter of, of 2015, we'll have new numbers. And we'll see how um, green building adoption fared in the face of, of, of more government regulation and whether that has driven a much faster diffusion of, of Energy Star, Energy Star buildings. Um, what, what Dave and I have, have brainstormed about is what the impact could be of a new CBEX. And this is technical, but Energy Star is based on a census of, 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 of buildings. And when that new census data comes out and we evaluate the performance of buildings against the new cross-section um, that has been collected in 2012, will people lose their Energy Star rating? And then ultimately, and what we're currently working on, is the correlation um, and the impact of green building certification or rents, occupancy rates, and prices. And that continuous work that has been done in 2007 and 2010 uh, by Maastricht and Berkeley. Um, and we believe it's important to continue that work and to continuously monitor the market in terms of the impact of green space on, uh, on investment performance. And with that, Chris, I want to hand it over to you. Great. Wow. So as, as everyone can tell, that was a, a tour de force in terms of a, a new way to look at uh, that the the state of the green building industry across the U.S. and, and a huge thanks to Dave as well for making this this possible and enabling this. So uh, just a couple of quick reactions and observations, and I think it's my job here to turn to some Q and A with these guys. Is one, I, I want to make sure that that listeners appreciate one of the novel things. Everyone has seen lists of green building adoption, both lead and Energy Star before, as Noah's pointed out. What is not one of the things that's novel here is that we have a denominator in this study, and that denominator comes from data that C.B. Richard Ellis brought to the table in terms of how big is the office market in these 30 markets. So in case you were just, could, that maybe might have skated by, that the fact that we actually have a denominator, we can talk about penetration rates and adoption rates, is, a, is, a, is one of the things that makes this study truly um, special. The other thing I would uh, underscore in Nils's closing remarks is that we often have uh, reactions to folks saying, hey, you know, you're these national average, you know, green buildings do this or do that. Uh, my local experience varies. Well, I think Nils' team has very clearly shown, yes, your experience varies. There is, there is both temporal and geographic variation in adoption. And so the story for Pittsburgh is fundamentally different than it is for Minneapolis or San Francisco. And that is, that is a data, you can put data on that problem. And so it doesn't, it means that everyone's experience is to some degree legitimate. It's just quite different. And that, that, those geographic and temporal differences are really important. And so one, there's two things I want to do to, to kind of merge, 
uh, to tr transition to a, uh, um, a, a, a Q and A. And the first one is, I think we could all take bets on the consequences of CBEX changing. That'll be an interesting game. We should probably have a, a pool on that or something. But I think a little more, inter a little more interesting on the short term is, Nils, you've written a, a bunch about the, the, the issues of kind of green premium versus brown discount. And when you look at these data, uh, can we begin to make some inferences about on a kind of market by market basis where we might expect premium and where we might expect effective discounts? Can you talk a little bit about the implications of those, those ideas for this study? Absolutely. Well, thanks, Chris, and, and um, it's a pleasure to, to be here with the, with the three of us in the same room and actually just sit back and, and, and brainstorm about this. And we can assure you that we don't have beer or wine, but it's, it's still coffee time. Um, to, to pick up on your last point, um, the impact of the of the of these very high adoption numbers in some markets on the financial implications of green building is green building becoming a commodity? Is green building a not from a nice to have? Is it becoming just a must have? Uh, what we have seen in a study we did in the UK is that there is once you start adding more and more green buildings to the same location. And there is a, 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 a depreciation, if you will, of, of, the, um, of the marginal effect of green building. And to put that into normal, normal people's language, um, if you add more green buildings to the market, the effective premium for each additional building is going down. The market in and of itself, uh, the, the location value is going up. But if you're green and, and, and you get a green neighbor, well, your effective premium that you were able to obtain because you were the first on the block is going down. It makes perfect economic sense, it makes perfect logical sense, and that's what we saw in a study we did in the UK. Admittedly, that was a, a fairly small sample. London is, is, a, is a market that's different from a lot of other markets. I think it resembles New York a lot, in fact. Um, and I do think that in some of these markets, we're going to see the same. Um, what's also important that in, in the lower end of, of our, our ranking, yeah, so a green building is still a specialty. And whereas brokers always have difficulties believing in the green premium because nobody's willing to pay more, people vote with their feet. So in terms of effective income, effective rent, as I call it, taking occupancy rates into account and taking incentives into account, I believe that in those lower tier, or not lower tier markets, just lower rank markets, um, that there's still a green premium. In the higher rank markets, I think things start to turn. And things start to turn into a what I call brown or black discount. Um, it's that not ha not having it, um, and I well, I'm curious about the, the thoughts of Dave about this, but I believe that in those markets, if you want to be competitive and you have a non-certified building, and it's not eligible for certification because in those markets, I think if you're eligible, you've done it. So if you haven't done it, you're probably not eligible. You really have to start thinking hard about retrofitting in order to get there. And in fact, that's what you see. That's what you see in San Francisco. It's what you see in New York. It's what you see in D.C. An interesting example, uh, when I was at the USGVC and I looked outside, at the other side of the street, indeed, they were re retrofitting a building. Because, honestly, it was a crappy old building as compared to the very nice LEED certified building that, 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 uh, that, uh, that the USGVC is in. So I really believe in, in that story. Uh, but I also really believe that in those markets where we have very high adoption numbers, that, that we're ready for the next step. This is not just about low-hanging fruit anymore. And, and, and indeed, looking at your building manager, whether it's CB or it's internal, you know, to twitch and tweak and get it to 75. No, no, no. This, this now really requires CapEx. Uh, well, I agree with everything that, that Nils has been saying, that five years ago, we were able to encourage a client to take some steps, be the first lead gold on this corner or the first lead whatever, uh, because we thought that there was a market premium. There was something about being first mover. Uh, I really do believe now, in particularly in the larger markets, that if you are not, then you are a laggard. So it's really almost table stakes, if you will. I mean, to be a Class A building today, you now have to be this uh, and to be considered as that. Uh, but also to the point that Nils was making about the cities, uh, I had the, I guess, unfortunate opportunity to have been in Pittsburgh a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I spoke to a couple of groups and we talked about this study. Um, and Pittsburghers weren't happy. They, they took this personally because actually, if you look at a lot of the dynamics of the city of Pittsburgh, the ballpark is green, 
that City Hall is green, that PNC headquarters buildings have gotten a lot of notoriety. In fact, PNC is now building what they consider to be the greenest building in the world. I think there's only about 40 greenest buildings in the world being built right now. Uh, but by and large, there's so many aspects of the city of Pittsburgh that are green. But again, by our study, and again, it's, it is what it is, it's looking at a specific narrow, narrow look, uh, there's only 10%. And I took a lot of heat. So, but it was interesting to me to see that some of these places like Pittsburgh were offended by our study, but they took notice of it. I also was, was very pleased to see that the, uh, city, or the, uh, the congressman from Minneapolis tweeted out our report uh, with pride, and, and I presumably sent it to all of his constituents. Minneapolis is the greenest city in the country. So I, I was very happy to see the impact that this was getting. That didn't really happen in Texas, right? Yeah. Pardon? Uh, <laughs> any tweets from Texas? No, no, not no. yet. It's, they're coming. Well, so, I mean, that's, I just to honor Pittsburgh for a second, that's, you know, there's a, I think that distinction here, we're looking at existing office buildings, Correct. and I think if you look at the adoption rates into new construction, I think that's other, another piece of the story is saying we're looking at the standing stock of, of office buildings, the competitive office building market. We know we have high adoption rates of green building practices in new construction, yet, especially over the last five years, new construction construction is a small fraction of office delivery. So that it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. It, it, it's like PNC Tower is a great example in Pittsburgh. It's a, it is going to be an awesome building. The convention center is an office building, but it, it, it's, a, it's a small fraction of the whole. Well, and to, and to that point, though, Pittsburgh, a couple points that they pointed out to me, and I think they're, they're, they're valid and important. Pittsburgh has really done a very good job of saving a lot of old buildings. Mm -hmm. There's really a terrific kind of a historical, uh, you, you look at, you walk around the streets of Pittsburgh and there's every vintage of building is there, Art Deco and Nouveau, and I, uh, because they really made a point of saving those old buildings, and, and certainly that is sustainable. Uh, you know, at, at, its, at its highest level, you, you really should argue that to keep the old stuff is better than tearing down a building whatever level of new. So they've done a good, nice job of that, and to your point, it's, it's more difficult then to bring those buildings up to certification. But also, I was told of at least five different buildings in the Pittsburgh market that currently are going through lead EV process. And because the market is a relatively small, small market, 20 yeah. plus million square feet, these five buildings together is about 20 uh, or uh, 2 million square feet, which would be another 10% of the market. Yep. So we could see in a year or so that Pittsburgh could go from 10% to 20%. But I did think it was very interesting just to find that this, that our study had it was catching people's attention and that they were using it against me in the one case and using it for me in another. Well, and, 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 and one thing I think is in, in important also, we put in those vintage effects. So we said, well, if, if you're certified two years ago with Energy Star, sure. But beyond that, we don't take that into account anymore because the market probably doesn't do that either. And for LEED, we took five years. But it is obviously interesting to see how this will evolve. If, if you're a LEED certified under, under LEED version 3, is that going to have the same impact as LEED version 4? It's still early days, but go to version 2, version 1. So that, while the uptake of green space has been fast, now the big question is, are people going to recertify? Uh, and is the market going to demand that recertification and also, well, reward or punish uh, uh, if you uh, if you do or do not recertify, and I think that's interesting because yes, you can be lead platinum certified in in in, in 2005, but does that really at some point say something about the um, well about, about the current performance of an asset? And and I believe that and we're now really at this at this point. It's no longer an inflection point. It's really an important part of the market. I think that's what this this study showed, and it's markedly different from five years ago when I first looked at this. But where is this going next? Well, that's a great, so one last thing to build on that. That's a perfect segue to my last question for you. And in the interest of time and everyone listening, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here. But that's one thing that you showed this tapering in market penetration um, in terms of the percentage of market. Yet when you showed these interesting buildings, the, the, the diagnostic characteristic of these interesting buildings is you had five, ten, ten plus Energy Star labels over successive years, yeah. many times um, multiple lead certifications at successively higher qualities. Yeah. So the, the greenest buildings in the market are characterized by this timeline, this pattern of, of achievement. Yeah. And it seems so that, that that question, there, I, I wanted to kind of emphasize that partially, that when we look at that taper, of course, the data under that taper is saying it's a taper in penetration, but this actual certification activity for both LEED and ENERGY STAR is, if anything, um, fairly constant or, or, or growing. So the flux 
of new, uh, the flux of labels into the marketplace is the same or growing, yet the thing is tapering, which means that there's a change going on. We're seeing a transition, like you said, to a recertification driven model. Yeah. It's, it's very apparent in Energy Star. It's starting to appear in EB. And I'm, I'm interested in that, just maybe dwelling a little bit more on that, because that's an important issue. As we taper in terms of over, the same buildings are being, what it means to be green isn't that first label, like you were saying, David. It's something different now. And if you look out two, three, four years, that pattern seems to be emergent. Is, does that reflect well, your Well, we're certainly seeing that on the buildings that we've done. And again, uh, we have a team internal to CB that has done a lot of lead EB. We, in fact, we're very proud that we had a press release a couple of weeks ago that they had reached the 300 label, uh, which is really quite extensive given the, the, the maybe 3,000 uh, globally. So. What we're starting to see, uh, because of the age of when we first were working in this, is that many of those earlier ones are now expiring on Lead EB, uh, and we are now working and quite busy on doing renewals. Mm -hmm. And so we are absolutely seeing that, that people are renewing their labels, uh, certifications, and they are striving to get a higher number. Uh, early on, it was it, it, a lot of people just got certified. That was the first, or they got silver. And now I think gold is the gold standard. So people are are, are raising the bar. The concern that I would have uh, with USGBC, I might have with this too, is that this, with, with version four, it is harder still. Uh, and so it's not just improving where you were against the static uh, protocol, but now having to raise the bar again yeah. and reach for label four, uh, for version four. And so I am hearing some pushback in the marketplace when I talk to people about their concerns about ability to do before and, and how much that's going to do. And, and, you know, we could continue on this for hours, but <laughs> now wearing briefly my Gresby hat, the market is dynamic. And if you were lead certified, let's say just certified under a program five years ago, you know, I think that just being constant in that, it, it basically means going backward because the market sees new construction. And so basically what sustainability is, is being pushed forward with zero net buildings, the greenest building in the world. They're being built in New York, in, in D.C., in, in, in every city actually in, in the U.S. So that's where the market is is, is shifting in terms, of, uh, in terms of sustainability. Plus buildings around you are being upgraded, retrofitted, optimized, etc. So standing still is really going backward. And now, just 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 to to preach uh, to preach a bit about Gresby, it's exactly what we see in Gresby. You could be a superstar five years ago and be nowhere right right now, and you could blame actually the methodology and et cetera, But I think you can only blame yourself because the market around you is waking up to the challenge and actually starting to implement and improve. So the thing, same thing I think will happen in the build environment, where. One certification, and it, uh, to me it's not about the certification, but the underlying characteristics that you certify is not going to do the job, especially not in, in the in these top 30 markets that we're looking at. And, and I would add something too. That historically, 20 years ago, a, a new building would be built, and what characterized that was it was fancier. It had, it had granite in the lobby. It had, some, it had some physical characteristics that made it stand out, that it was a prettier building in a lot of ways. It was around architecture. What we're seeing now, and, and that then, to compete, the older buildings to compete with that, they just had to put granite in the lobby. I mean, there were so many lobbies that were redone, and you redid your elevator cabs, and you did some things. And that's how you met the competition of the new buildings. Today's new building is coming in not just with new architecture, but with new technology and with new energy efficiency. And is doing. And they're, they're all being built to lead certification at some level or another. And so my, my, my belief is that the existing buildings who are see themselves in that same class as the new buildings are going to have to not just put granite in the lobby, they're going to have to meet those technological improvements that the new buildings are bringing in. And so I think that's what's going to help drive the market as well. Well, this is great. So uh, we obviously, as Neil said, we can go on like this. But in the interest of closing out this, this particular podcast, I, I want to refer folks to some places to get more information. Um, you certainly can search the web, and I would encourage you to do so for the for CBRE's Real Green Research Challenge. It, it's an impressive and, and, and obviously impactful program, and that's going to continue for a little while now. And I would also, as Neil said, uh, check out gresby.com and, and check out some of the information on, on transparency as it's kind of sweeping through the real estate sector. And it, I know that this information is posted on nilscoke.com, and so you can go down and download uh, download information from there. And I, I like the fact that Nils now is a brand. Yeah. Yeah, he is brand. Well, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. And uh, and we we hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, there'll be information on the website how to how to how to follow folks on on social media and so forth. Thanks, and have a great day.